Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche Cast. I am the Diggity Doodah Doc. As always, joined by the Wobbly Wildcard. And we are here for a special Game of Thrones episode 1. Yarn. I think the name of the episode was Winterfell because the whole thing pretty much happened at Winterfell. And we are just going to talk our way through a bunch of ideas, topics and highlights from episode 1. And we might get bigger picture as well. As always, the best way to support the Niche Cage is on Patreon. So if you like the Niche Cage, if you like what we're doing, hit the link, El Niche Cage, on Patreon. And support the Niche Cage on Patreon. It is the best way to support us as we endeavor to just do what we love to do. Wildcard. How, what was, what was the feeling you had as as episode one wound down i think it was bran stark and jamie lannister's scene how are you feeling right then and hello yeah hello um ah mate i just every time someone turned around in that courtyard and bran was just already staring at them that little bastard's starting to creep me out i tell you what and I mean, Jamie has reason to be to be creeped out because he turned around and saw the fella sitting in a wheelchair that he put him in, like seven, almost well, eight seasons ago, wasn't it? The first episode of it was one of the first episodes anyway of season one, and there was a lot of actually callback. I thought to that, um, it was like one more of a, a number of things where they called back their very start of Game of Thrones, and you had like the procession, Daenerys and Jon riding into Winterfell. A lot like the the time at the very start where Robert Baratheon rode into Winterfell. You even had that kid climbing up on a tree for a better look, which I think I think is a callback to Arya doing the same thing. But I can't. I didn't check that, but apparently it is. Um, if it's not that, Arya definitely did that when Ned Stark got killed, ran around and climbed up on a statue to have a look. So she she has form. Um, and even just like the the nature of the episode, where you. It was set largely in Winterfell and not Winterfell under siege, not Winterfell under, you know, um, under foreign uh, control, as we've seen in the past. It's Winterfell under the control of the Starks and the Northerners and, um, you know, dealing with some allies from around the place and dropping these little subtleties because we got to this point where everything had been really focusing in on this one threat of you know, the bad guys up north who are marching down to get them. And in two episodes, there's going to be a rather enormous 80-minute battle scene that uh, takes place at Winterfell between the armies of the undead and the armies of whatever's left living. And, you know, going to be a big old extravaganza. But in the meantime, we've got this little thing where we've just got those, you know, it's very much like the old days of Game of Thrones where you get these little subtle hints that... You know, personalities are clashing and the politics are rising up again. And I didn't realize how much I missed that. And prior to, as we were just unloading our minds about Game of Thrones to each other prior to recording, the way you you, you painted it was very apt to my mind is trying to figure out who is deceiving who. Who's bullshitting who. And that's, a uh, for me, and I wrote, I kind of, hinted at this in a different way in our written review of episode one there were different factions there were different teams there were different people and (laughs) the funny thing for me is that they're all trying to deceive each other they're all trying to play the game still like it's their natural habit it's their natural way of doing things in this in this world in this realm and a lot of it doesn't really matter like even in the face of doomsday they all know because they're all there in winterfell that's the reason they are all there they all know what is coming they all know shit's about to hit the fan but they can't help themselves they have to fall back into their natural way of uh you know plotting and scheming or like i don't think 
maybe Sansa is plotting and scheming because we saw how she was plotting and scheming against Littlefinger in the last season. But we plotting and scheming we don't really associate with Sansa. But it was her natural way. She's very skeptical and she's she's playing her own game in her own way and it's a natural thing for her to do but she also knows at some stage in the coming weeks that Winterfell is going to get fucked over it's just a it's a weird paradigm to have these people know what is coming and not be able to help themselves from falling um into their normal habits their normal kind of routine of plotting and scheming well, there's a reason for the plotting and scheming, which again goes back to season one, where I think it was Cersei said to Ned Stark, when you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. And that's what it's about, is survival. And you um, you chucked in a guy who perhaps, um, I don't know, perhaps some people suspected, perhaps a lot of people didn't suspect, because he's kind of a beloved character on the show, but you're a Contarian scheme in something. Is that, is that where, you're, where you're going with that? I do. Uh, but I want to start that with just the interesting juxtaposition of to to kind of set that scene because we had Arya telling Jon Snow that Sansa is the smartest person she knows, which, given the relationship between Arya and Sansa, is a pretty heavy compliment. Like I think that would have got overshadowed in a lot of people's minds by all the other stuff that happened in episode one but for Arya to tell Jon Snow in that situation where Jon Snow is questioning Sansa Sansa is a bit chilly to other people mainly Daenerys because Sansa's trying to run Winterfell she's trying to do her job and a lot of shit has been flipped upside down so she's understandably feeling how she feels but for Arya to say that Sansa Stark is the smartest person she knows is a pretty amazing compliment. And then we had Sansa Stark, the smartest person Arya knows, telling Tyrion to his face that he used to be the cleverest person she knew. Or something along those lines, not a direct quote. But pretty much telling Tyrion he's not as smart as he thinks. And I think that just it foreshadows something. It foreshadows Tyrion perhaps overthinking, over planning, over strategizing a situation. And then came another scene talking about loyalty with Davos and Varys. Varys and there was a pretty blatant highlight of Tyrion after Davos was talking about earning the trust of the people in the north and then the camera stayed on Tyrion a bit too long Tyrion was pondering trust he was pondering loyalty so among all the shenanigans of episode one Tyrion was painted in a certain way and that was obviously it's all deliberate and you know don't need to go down that route but it was just very interesting to see how quickly that changed from previous episodes although wildcard if you do remember Tyrion was low key at a uh, a key figure in a few scenes last season and when uh, Jon Snow and Daenerys were having making babies key point there making babies Tyrion was just lurking in the in the in the hallway kind of disappointed kind of what the fuck kind of intrigued I think as well and then you also had Tyrion and Cersei at King's Landing with this like mystery scene where Tyrion highlights how Cersei is drinking not drinking wine interesting point that you highlighted in the written preview written, written, written review as well which we might get to and then Tyrion has this discussion with Cersei that we don't even know about so Tyrion was low-key 
an important figure in those scenes. Like, there was no, like, you could have just had John and, and John and Daenerys having sex and just left it at that. But it was John and Daenerys having sex, and then suddenly there's Tyrion doing his best Bran Stark impersonation, just <laughs> yeah. sitting in the corner watching, peeking like, in. Like, yeah. And then you had this very deliberate mystery conversation between Tyrion and Cersei Lannister. And now in episode one, we've got pretty much the dude everyone universally loves because of how smart he is being told. He's not very smart. And you have this little loyalty nugget as well. So I don't know if that's going to result in Tyrion betraying Daenerys. I don't know if that's going to result in Tyrion playing 3D chess and just like just doing whatever. I don't know. I don't know what it results in. But it was just a very kind of under the radar little narrative there that was uh, revolving around Tyrion in episode one. Yeah, well, when when Arya was talking to um, Jon and she mentioned that thing about Sansa being the smartest person that she knows, and that's a that's like that's a big moment for Arya as a character. It was obviously a big moment for Sansa because that's the um that's the script telling us that if we hadn't already figured it out, Sansa is a legit player right now. And Sansa has been in a situation for most of the series where she's been told what to do and she's just been in like gone from, you know, bad situation to worse situation to a worse situation and now she's finally she is in control now. You know, and that's like a little signifier that, you know, this is a character that we have to take completely seriously because she's very good at what she does. But it was also not just that, but the when John called her out on that after that, he's like, oh, that's a bit funny after, you know, how the way you two used to behave and back in the day. And then she says, well, she's protecting our family. And it was just a line in the sand. And John sort of like muttered to himself, "Well, I'm trying to protect the family too." And, like John's done what he thinks is right, and he's probably done the only thing that was um, applicable in the situation. Uh, that whole thing gets very wrinkly when you realize that he sort of pledged allegiance to someone who actually he now realizes has a worse claim at the throne than he does, which is going to be weird. Doesn't matter in terms of the old uh, Battle of Winterfell, but afterwards it might be a situation where. Uh, there's a there's a little bit of a thing because Daenerys's whole character, like that's her that's what she believes is that she's been raised to one day be the queen of the Seven Kingdoms and telling her that maybe she shouldn't be it might be a little bit of a of a shock to her system let's say and she hasn't always handled shocks in the best way she's um t she has a bit of a temper let's just say but yeah Arya drawing a line in the sand there between John. So just so not you know not a threat not a nothing wild but just saying you know uh, be careful where you stand here Johnny boy, and Sansa sort of did the same thing you're right with with Tyrion where she she didn't when she said that you used to be the cleverest I used to think you were the cleverest person I knew or something along those lines, you know she wasn't just saying you're a bit you know she wasn't just saying you're not as smart as you think she's also saying that. I am now smarter, you know, she, she's saying that your position isn't what it used to be, and that's where that scene where they were talking with Davos and Varys, and Davos was just saying, you know, very relevant things about these northerners, they don't trust easy, if you want, if you want them to trust you, you've got to earn that trust, and that's completely legit, if you live in, if you live in the freezing north, I think that makes perfect sense, I think that's completely consistent with all those characters, even down to Sansa not trusting Daenerys yet, and the trick there is that Daenerys expects to be, you know, treated like a queen wherever she goes because she thinks that's her rightful honor. And she tries her best to be a very good queen, but she certainly has this element of just, like, um, entitlement to her, which is um, potentially a bit of a problem going forward because Sansa does not hand out entitlement unless you prove that you're worthy of it. But maybe that's what the Battle of Winterfell is for. I don't know. Um, next week's going to be interesting because supposedly they're only a day away from marching downwards, as we learned near the end there. Um, it's old uh, Tormund and Beric are racing against time to get back before them to warn Winterfell. 
So we know that the Army of the Dead are right there on the doorstep, and yet there's a whole episode before the Battle of Winterfell. So what happens in that time? Going to be pretty interesting. I'm guessing Jamie's going to have a lot to do with it, because um, he's got some things to answer for with basically everybody who's there at Winterfell right now. But he's a charming dude. He seems to find his way out of these troubles more often than not. But that scene with Varys, Varys Tyrion, and Davos. So Davos is talking about loyalty, and then they, someone says something about, one of them suggests, I think, a marriage might help engender loyalty, like if, if John married Daenerys and therefore they had an equal, um, you know, kingship, queenship thing going on, maybe that would work. Um, but, and then they sort of stood on the top of the, the castle walls looking out down at them as the two of them had a bit of a, bit of a moment to themselves not realizing they were being spied upon, which is basically everyone's mission operative in this um, in this episode, because Bran was out there staring, Tyrion's looking over walls, Tyrion knows some things, Varys is doing this the whole time. And so I think Varys said something about the two of them, John and Danny being down there, something about their youth, and um, I can't remember what he said, but the, the line went along the, you know, it was along the lines of, um, they don't realize that they're, youth doesn't last or something or that eventually they'll be old and it and they'll be you know struggling for relevance and i thought that was such a poignant scene because the Tyrion goes something like well i'm not that old well at least i'm not as old as him pointing at davos and you got these three characters who have all been really influential up until now three characters who have always been known for being wise for being a step ahead for being practical for being smart and above all for just like finding a way to survive Tyrion especially, but Varys has been a bit of a weasel the whole way through. Davos has always, you know, he's had his troubles with, um, with Stannis, with, uh, you know, even with, like, uh, Theon's family, with, you know, the whole way along with, um, Daenerys. And, like, here you have three characters who don't have a massive role to play in the story the way that it stands. Like, none of them are necessary at the moment, and when characters aren't necessary, they just get killed off in the show. It's just the way it goes. And so I think this is why Tyrion's getting scheming. Because I think Tyrion realizes... Varys seems to have accepted it in a weird way, the way he said that. That his role in the story isn't as important anymore. And you either take a back step there, or you fight against it. And if you fight against it, you make enemies, and then that's when bad things happen. Davos is fine, because I think he's a little more comfortable in just being like... The wise guy you turn to if necessary but i don't think Tyrion's up for that game i think Tyrion expects he's the hand to the king or hand to the queen and he wants to be the smartest guy in the room in whatever room he's in and he's been told that he's not that and he's sort of bit i mean Varys effectively told him right now now nah, you're not one of them all these young or the you know the young star kids and daenerys and like this next generation coming up to prominence He's been told, you're not one of them, you're one of us. And he's saying, well, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure about that. I think I'm still one of them, though. And he's stuck in between in just this weird place where he doesn't know what he's going to do next. And I think he realizes that if he doesn't, if he's a, if he's irrelevant, someone's just going to kill him. Cersei's already told Bronn to go out there and kill both her brothers, you know, and I He's he's the ultimate survivalist on this show. It's why everyone loves him because he's always used his wits to survive, and he's just bounced from situation to situation, talking his way out of trouble. And I think he's struggling to figure out a way to talk his way out of this one because he the worst thing. I mean, if you're irrelevant, you're dead. You know, if and he's he's starting to feel that irrelevance a bit. I think. <laughs> so many so many little pieces of of life advice in Game of Thrones and especially episode eight. But... <laughs> yeah, it's all over. But you just drop one there. If you're irrelevant, you might as well be dead. Like, just take that into your life. If you're irrelevant in whatever you're doing, you might as well be dead. Uh, oh, I've got so many points to jump off from. The, yeah, I know. What I forgot in writing about that scene with Sansa and Tyrion, which you alluded to but not in the right way, was that after Sansa talked to Syrian, Syrian, Tyrion, it cut to Bran, and Bran was watching, and then Tyrion looks at Bran. So Sansa tells Tyrion he's not the cleverest person anymore, and then Tyrion looks over, and Bran is watching him. 
So I think what we're going to see, I think Bran can can kind of, he's catching a vibe. He's catching a vibe as well. So I don't think Tyrion is going to be plotting and scheming under the cloak of invisibility. <laughs> and I don't know if Tyrion is fully aware of what Bran can do. Now that then throws into a, you've got the different pockets of people plotting and scheming. And I think before I said that it doesn't really matter because the Night King's coming. What I, a better thing to say is that it doesn't really matter because Bran exists. And that's obviously these characters don't really know the full extent of Bran's powers. But the real power players here are Bran and then Sam and like Team Bran. So whoever's on Team Bran, which is Bran and Sam. Because everyone else is trying to... And in Team Bran, you've also got Sansa, you've also got Arya because they're, you know, they're for the, for the ride. But it's just, it's, you've got all these plotters and schemers, all these people trying to make their moves... But no one can do what Bran can do, and he's the one really pulling the strings, and that uh, can be extrapolated into a very broad Game of Thrones discussion as to whether Bran is putting things in motion because that's how they have to play out type of thing. So Bran is making events happen. Um, which is a weird discussion that I don't want to go on. But it was just it was just weird remembering that Tyrion looked over after being pretty much handed the the most brutal insult that he's ever been handed and Bran was watching um then we flow into Jamie Lannister and again Bran because Bran sees everything he knows everything Bran is not going to attack Jamie Lannister and by attack I mean he threw me uh, out of the tower now I've got a broken back. Fuck him. Bran isn't going to do any of that because Bran, as someone who is setting things in motion, he understands 3,000% that he had to be thrown out of that tower. He had to go on that journey. He had to start that journey as it happened to be where he is now. And Bran also understands that Jamie Lannister uh, perhaps killed Daenerys' father for a reason. The only person who can offer that insight is Bran Stark. Otherwise, Jamie Lannister is the Kingslayer, the man who irrationally killed Daenerys' father. Well, with Bran existing, some truth can come to light there. So I don't think... I don't know what role Jamie is going to play, but he's going to be all good because Bran is there. So it's a bit of a mind fuck to think that the dude that Jamie, the most notable shitty action of the show, obviously Jamie becoming the Kingslayer happened before the show, but the most notable shitty action of Jamie Lannister in the show isn't going to be viewed in any real negative light for other people yes but as soon as Bran Stark talks and offers the um exposes everything it's going to be all good I wonder if we're going to get a fair bit of Bran flashback next episode because I mean it's the crazy thing about the show but it's also kind of one of the coolest things about the show is that so much completely like absolutely useful and essential knowledge of events these events happened before the show actually began and not just like a little bit before but like a generation before there's all these ramifications from these things that happened you know um liana stark marrying um uh whatever the bastard's name was um daenerys's older brother um you know, and, and Robert's rebellion and these things that we've never actually seen. And I wonder, because it just seems like, it seems like time is such of the essence with the with the bad guys marching south that there's there's 50 minutes to kill next episode and it can't all just be the trial of Jamie Lannister because we sort of know how that's going to go. I mean, Daenerys is a bit of a, 
she holds a grudge, you know? And Sansa, she holds a grudge too. But Sansa holds a grudge against Cersei more than anyone else. And even we saw with her and Tyrion, she she's not all cool with Tyrion. And it was always a little bit harsh how she treated him back in the day. Just, I mean, it's not harsh because she was just in a situation she had no control over that she never should have been in. But... Tyrion was actually like trying to do the best for her and protect her a bit in that in that place and you know but she showed that she's not she's not going to necessarily forgive him for what his family did for her but she will look past it in terms like she's not going to just behead him there and then so and I think she's gonna I think she can come to a similar place with Jamie where it's not like we're best mates here but you're against Cersei, I'm against Cersei, that's good enough for me right now, as it stands. Daenerys is the trick there, because I don't know that she's gonna, she's just, yeah, as as hard as she tries to be a good queen, she's, she can be, uh, she can be a bit of a problem sometimes, and I don't think Jon's gonna tell her about, about what Sam told him in the crypt anytime soon, because I think he's scared of confrontation in that way, uh, it just seems like a very Johnny thing to do. Is to hold that one close to his um, close to his chest and just carry that burden alone for a little while. But that that the trial of Jamie Lannister or whatever the hell's going to go on, where he just has to answer to a bunch of these people he's screwed over in the past, that's not going to take fifty minutes. So something's going to happen next episode, and I, you know, I, I'm hoping that this this uh, series is going to have a lot of those little brand nuggets where he just like, you know eyeballs roll back in the roll back in the skull and let's go back in time and have a peek at some things here and answer some questions we've been wondering about for a long time i think we're going to see a fair bit of that uh probably from that robert's rebellion era uh, there's still a few things there that haven't been um haven't been answered have you uh i still can't oh, i have to look up the fella's name i can't remember his name that um married liana but um rhaegar rhaegar that's the one thank you rhaegar have you heard the thing about his harp I know of his harp, and his harp may be in Winterfell. That's the one. So he was like a, he was like this romantic prince, and everyone loved him. And he apparently was just he had this stunning singing voice, and he was incredible at playing his harp. And he used to play his harp, and all the women had swooned. And supposedly, um, supposedly his harp has gone missing, and they don't know where it is. And the theory is that it's been buried with Lyanna in Winterfell in the crypts there. And it was pretty, you know, when um, when Sam told John about his lineage, and he said your father, and then John interrupts and is like, my father was the most honourable man I ever knew, and it's like, yeah, he, he was because he carried the secret to his grave. You know, it's it's pretty unbelievable that he was able to do that, especially in this world where secrets are like currency, and he told him that story in the crypts, right by Ned Stark's um you know statue there it was pretty pretty um deliberate obviously in terms of the way it was written but you know it's very symbolic and i think the crypts are another area where we're going to have to spend a fair bit of time because there's a few more unanswered secrets down there as well that we haven't got to yeah it's just a lot of a lot of mystery to unwrap and unpackage the what i will finish where episode one almost finished and we got the uh as someone with blue eyes, I related to uh, the little little scene there with uh, uh, Tormund, yeah, which was probably yeah one of the the best line of episode one, and then we were, then we arrived and we got the uh, the kid. I don't exactly um, my memory is terrible. Lord Umber, Umber yeah. I, I forget his. I think it was Ned Umber. I thought that was the same kid that was climbing the tree at the start at first, but I think it can't be because he was a lord, so he would obviously have, like, pride of position in the parade. He wouldn't have had to climb a tree. Yeah, he would have been well looked after. Um, I should think so. And then he's obviously been fucked over by the uh, Night's King and blah, blah, blah. Do you have any kind of theories or ideas on, on the symbolism at work here? Because... Just to get the ball rolling, well, we won't go too deep into this, but just to get the spark ignited here, you mentioned a lot about cycles and the cyclical nature of um, Game of Thrones, how things that have happened before are now being regurgitated, and just how everything affects everything. 
obviously there's a natural cycle at play with the coming and going of the seasons and as you learn about the history of game of thrones you realize that many of the ideas are just you know being churned over in a cyclical nature so do you have any and then we have the knight's king a lot of his stuff is spirals it swirls it's stuff that may allude to cycles do you have any idea on the symbolism at play here because it was a pretty blatant symbolism symbol well, not it's a only, message, wasn't it? That's what they said. It's a message. But not only was it the the standard, uh, what do you what do you call it? Swirl. Spi- it's not a spiral. It's a yeah. It's not actually a spiral, really. It's almost like a sun type shape, but with curved um, the you know the curved arms coming off like a little circle in the middle. I called it a spiral in the written thing, but technically, you know, a spiral is a one single line that wraps around itself. Yeah, so whatever it is, we got that which we've got before at various scenes in Game of Thrones, but this time it was ignited on fire, and we had a burning symbol. Made it look more like a sun. So do you have any any prophecies there? I'm glad you brought that one up, because I nearly forgot about that, but I think that's probably the most important thing that we saw in this episode, and... First of all, it's a message, right? Blatantly, it's a message. But is it a message to who? Like, is it a message to John? Because we know the Night King and John have um, had a little bit of a face-off in the past. Is that is that what he's trying to get at? Is he putting a message to the living people? Is it perhaps a message to the children of the forest? Because we know from Bran's green sight that the children of the forest created the first White Walker. Um, I think it's implied that that was the Night's King, the the first one. And we saw that scene where they created him, and they they tied a man up to the to a weirwood tree, and they were all standing around it in that exact shape, in that sort of spiral thing there with the with the arms coming off and curves. And we also saw that symbol uh, way back in like season three or something like that, when John was marching north of the wall, and I think it was when he was with Mance Raider, and then they came upon the shape in the snow sort of created by just bits of dead horses and i guess the knight's king's been watching the godfather or something like that if he's dropping horses heads around the place but it's a it's clearly a message um well you've also you've of, forgot you've forgot bran like bran is a major adversity of course to the, yeah bran's looked directly into the knight's king's eyes hasn't he yeah gave so away his a, position that time bran and john are fairly similar in their standing against the knight's king yes and also the fiery symbol i mean fire is daenerys isn't it and fire is dragons and they have a dragon from daenerys now and they there's also been a you know there's a thing going around on the internet pointing out how similar that shape is while it's on fire to the um targaryen sigil which is like a dragon with three heads and it's sort of like arranged in a way where it looks kind of like a spiral just because its tail its wings its three heads its arms its legs sort of thing it's i'm not i'm not fully sure that that works um because i think the symbol is its own thing and the other i forgot as well the other thing is they've seen this in the caves in um dragonstone where they went and there were a bunch of symbols on the wall there and one of them was this exact thing this like circle with these spirally arms reaching off of it so it's definitely something that means something, and we obviously don't know what it means yet. Um, is it like a, you know, spirals often mean like rebirth and and like creativity and um, replenishment and these kind of things. Where this is like, I'm just talking general symbology here. This is what they often mean because it's you know co- coming back around, and that that's a very Game of Thrones idea, like you already said. So that's a, I mean, that's a, a that's a thing. I don't know exactly. Um, where they're going with that but it's interesting I think what it means the most isn't about like getting beyond literal meanings of the symbol I think the most important implication of that is that the Night's King isn't just charging down because he wants to kill everything the Night's King's leaving messages and if he's leaving messages that means he has something to say and if he has something to say that means he has like some kind of ideology some kind of purpose beyond just pure 
I am alive, I suffer, I will kill everything in my sight. You know, he he has a he has a scheme of some sort. He has some kind of plan, and he's um he well he has something to say, and I don't know what it is, but the fact that he can say something, the fact that he has this kind of idea, bit of a um bit of a hint that maybe that character is is more than just this embodiment of evil that it's often been presented as maybe this character has some you know some real depth and and perhaps even suffering to them and hey i guess that's what we're going to find out over the next few weeks isn't it because i'm very much on board with that like uh it's the one last idea on that is that game of thrones has never been like pure evil you know it's never been something like good versus evil it's always been complicated and when um when daenerys next week yaps at jamie and says you killed my dad you bastard what are you doing he's gonna say well i killed him because he was being a dickhead to everyone and i had to save the realm you know he was gonna kill everyone else if i didn't stop him okay i broke my oath but i at the same time you know i did what i thought i had to do like in his mind he was acting in the honorable way in that situation he sacrificed his own oath and his own you know reputation in order to do something for the good of the community daenerys sees that as a terrible act he saw it as a good act it's all about perspective it's not about like this blatant right versus wrong thing because there is no right versus wrong this is just a normal life lesson again from game of thrones everything is based on perspective every war that's ever been fought every argument it's because one person has a different perspective to the other one and they don't take the time to communicate and figure out where those perspectives overlap why those perspectives exist like what are the complicated reasons before this uh for this like confrontation etc it's all perspective and this this knight's king and the white walkers have been presented as like this ecological event almost like you know winter is coming here come the ice zombies as if they're like this um this kind of like unstoppable just force like a hurricane rolling through town kind of thing and I think there's more to it than that because I just don't think that's a Game of Thrones idea and just because they're perceived that way we've never had like the Night's King doesn't talk we've never heard him say what he wants to say because as we've got is this message on the wall made out of you know dead kid so I just think I just think there's more to that character than we realize yet and I don't think he's a hundred percent evil and I think there's something there there's something to say and there's something going on there that we don't know about yet Q Bran. <laughs> Lovely jubbly. Lovely jubbly. I will say, Melisandre has been absent. That's a fair point. Didn't even think about I, her. I am interested to see how what role she plays. And then, to finish with, to to not to wrap it all up, but to, to do the opposite, you said there may be more depth to the Night King's character. I'm going to go one step further... And you, because you said that he's leaving signs. So if you're leaving signs, that means you know that those signs are going to be stumbled upon and interpreted. Yeah. So you know, which is when you consider what the Night King is doing in in terms of going south and wiping everything out in his path. Why would you leave a sign if there's no one to read the sign? So, that leads me to believe that the Night King knows exactly what's going to happen. Because there's a couple of ideas that the Night King was waiting for the dragons to arrive north of the wall. That the Night King was waiting for Jon Snow to come north of the wall and to do what he had to do. And then, obviously, that will lead into the dragons coming as well. So there is a maybe a bit of an idea that the Night King is or has seen certain events. Because you only leave sign if you know that that sign is going to be viewed. So he, my, I reckon that he knows that certain things have happened, that he knows that certain things will happen, and that's what he is operating on. And if he's got that Children of the Forest magic to him, then, I mean, so does Bran, really. It's, I think there must still be Children of the Forest alive. And I also reckon, 
you know, way back in the day, there's that thing about, um, and Bran went there, Bran saw the birth of Jon Snow, and Ned was there, there was a tower, I can't remember what the tower was called, but Jon from that scene is still alive. The one other person who was in that scene who's still alive is the father of um, Mira and the other kid, I forget, that accompanied um, uh, Bran, that that family there has probably still got a little bit of a role to play as well. And the, we know that they're considered weirdos in, in the North because they've got this like connection with some of that old magic. The Reed Fano is... The Reed is Fano. The... Jojen was the boy's name, eh? Yeah, there we go. Howlin' Reed. And Hal- Howlin' Reed sounds like he should be a blues singer or something, eh? There we have it. Wildcard episode one. I'm... F- fizzing for episode two and that is a wrap so we will be back sometime next week for some game of thrones podcast chitter chatter if you've got any ideas theories or whatever just hit us up with a comment and we will see you again next week later bye